present Eric Kim, who is a professional photographer, currently based out of uh, Berkeley, California. And Eric's forte is street photography and travel photography, and he's just like a master at capturing urban landscapes. So we are super honored to have him walking us through this art form today. And Eric, let's uh, hand it over to you. Take it all away. Right. Um, first of all, I'm so happy and excited to have all of you guys here. Um, I know you guys all probably have busy schedules, and uh, the fact that you guys made some time for me today uh, is really wonderful. And yeah, so you know, I I've been shooting street photography for about eight years now, since um, I was about 18, and I'm uh, 26 years old. Uh, I've been very fortunate to uh, be able to travel the world, uh, spread my love and passion of street photography to you know anyone who's interested in learning more about it. And you know, this certainly isn't going to be the world's most comprehensive talk on street photography. It's just based on the lessons that I've personally long, uh, learned along the way. And ultimately, my hope is, um, you know, for those of you guys who either know a lot about street photography or not so much about street photography, that you can learn a thing or two that um, essentially might help you better understand the, the genre of street photography and also uh, get some practical tips and stuff like that. So can I just jump into it right now? All right, I'm not hearing yes, anyone else. Can. Okay. You go perfect. for it, Eric. All right. Actually, one thing I want to mention to the entire uh, audience, if you have questions for Eric, he will be happy to answer them after his presentation. So just enter them through the questions module on the control panel, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Thanks, everyone. Go for it, Eric. OK, cool. And uh, once again, thank you so much to iFi for organizing um, this free webinar. Uh, I think they're doing really awesome stuff uh, combining technology and art. And so yeah, so make sure to, to check them out. And uh, yeah, with no further ado, we'll get started. So um, one of the first questions that a lot of people ask me is, what is street photography? What is street photography? How do I do it? What is considered street photography and what isn't? And to me, I generally have a very open and broad view and definition of street photography. For me, the definition of street photography is capturing humanity. And a lot of other people on the internet you know, have very rigid definitions of street photography. Um, generally, the, the consensus amongst most street photographers is that street photography is generally done in a public place. Um, it, quote, quote, should be candid, meaning don't ask for permission. Uh, the subject doesn't want, uh, shouldn't be aware of you taking their photograph and whatnot. But over the years, as I've studied more street photography, I don't think street photography actually has to be done candidly. I think you could also do it with permission. Um, I don't think street photography necessarily has to include people. Generally, the best photos <laughs> include people. And I think that street photography is ultimately something that's very subjective and something that's very personal. Um, for me, the reason I got interested in street photography is that I studied sociology as an undergraduate. And to me, street photography is sociology with a camera. Um, through sociology, it's, it's all about studying uh, people, the environment, society. And street photography gives me the opportunity to go out and connect with other individuals in the world. And I'd have to say a lot of the things I've learned through street photography in terms of building my confidence, approaching strangers, and just kind of living each moment to the fullest has not only made me a better photographer, but also as a better human being. So for the purpose of this talk, um, to me, street photography is essentially capturing humanity. And, and I think the best street photos are generally the ones that captivate your emotion and your soul, photos that kind of offer more questions than provide answers. And therefore, this open-ended approach to street photography is something that uh, appeals to me. One of the questions a lot of people might ask is, you know, why shoot street photography? Because there's so many different genres of photography out there. You know, wedding photography, landscape, portraiture, all, there's like a million sub-genres of photography out there. Um, for me, I personally see street photography as the most difficult type of photography out there, both in terms of, you know, photographically, that you have to capture a moment in a split second and not miss the quote, quote, decisive moment. Secondly, you have to really open up yourself emotionally and you have to make yourself vulnerable because one of the most difficult things in street photography is to approach a stranger, take a photo maybe with or without his own permission, and overcoming that fear barrier, and which is something we're going to talk about in a minute. And I think ultimately street photography kind of gives me the opportunity to just get out of my apartment, get off of Facebook, get off of my phone, and just really interact with the world. And I think street photography is 
a way for you to also become more mindful and more grateful for uh, the interactions you have with strangers and just the world. I mean, street photography, sometimes the most small and subtle, you know, mundane detail or person can make the most beautiful photograph. Um, this photograph I, I shot, uh, I was riding the BART, which is uh, the subway in the Bay Area in California. And, you know, I saw this woman and she was sitting there with these amazing glasses and, you know, they kind of look like a Coke bottle, like Millhouse glasses, and they just kind of give her an interesting uh, magnifying look. Generally, when I come across situations where I'm not sure if I'm going to upset the person, I'll just, um, you know, whenever I'm in doubt, I'll just go and ask them. And so I went up to this woman and I said, oh, excuse me, miss, I love your glasses, I love your, your look, do you mind if I made a few photos of you? And what she told me was, you know, initially I saw you with your camera kind of looking at me and initially I was quite hesitant to being photographed by, uh, by you, but the fact that you asked for permission made me feel so much more comfortable and so much more at ease. So yes, you could take my photograph. And so I ended up making a bunch of uh, photographs of her. And essentially I have um, some images uh, that I like to show you, which is always fun to see the kind of the behind the scenes. Um, and so looking at, this is my cool, cool contact sheet of all the different photos I've taken. So I took about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about 15 photos. Um, this is another big tip I'll give you to in street photography is don't just take one photo of somebody and move on. Work it from different angles. Uh, all these photos were shot on a Ricoh GR. It's a digital pocket camera. And you could see um, how I shot these photos at different angles, caught really close, uh, used a flash. Another practical tip is uh, whenever possible, I recommend not to crop. Try to get the, the framing right in camera. And generally when I was taking these photos, I was talking to her asking about her background, who she was, and uh, little, little did I know, but she was actually uh, a feminist at UC Berkeley in the early 60s, one of the, one of the very first. And she told me this, the, the history of feminism, her role in it, and we just had this amazing engaged conversation for about 15 minutes. And another thing I learned about street photography, sometimes you'll have wonderful interactions with strangers that don't yield any interesting photographs. But I think that's okay. Sometimes I often find the, the conversations are more interesting than the photographs um, themselves. And, you know, some of the, the tips and tricks I'll give you guys is, you know, how to shoot street photography. So, going back, um, so a lot of people define street photography in different ways. Um, the, the best analogy I'll use street photography is kind of like rock music. So, um, you know, for those guys listening, do you guys like rock music? If so, in your own heads, think about all the different types of rock music out there. So, you know, you got heavy metal, you got rock and roll, classic rock, alternative rock, pop rock, Christian heavy metal, death rock, you know, you, you name it. And I think street photography is kind of like rock music. Everyone in rock music are like, yeah, we are the real rock music. Real rock music is Elvis. Real rock music is the Beatles. Real rock Rock metal is something that involves Satan and, you know, headbanging or whatever. Uh, I think street photography is kind of the same way. Um, I think there's a lot of different types of street photography, different ways to shoot street photography. So, for example, off the top of my head, um, you know, you kind of have more candid street photography, which is street photography without permission. Uh, you think about the classic black and white photos of Henri Cartier-Bresson of guys jumping over puddles and bicycles and whatnot. Uh, also, I think um, the type of street photography I'm interested in is quote, quote, street portraiture where, you know, either with or without permission, you're approaching a stranger and you're making a photo that's really close and mostly other face. Um, there's a saying which I love is that eyes are the windows to the soul. So for me, with physical proximity also comes emotional proximity. So the, the closer I get to my subjects, the more I feel like I can interact with them, the more I can feel their emotions, the more I can empathize with them. Uh, another type of street photography out there is uh, urban landscapes where you're essentially more or less taking photos of the urban environment and it doesn't even have to include people in it but the, the tricky thing is how can you make a photo of an urban environment but still have it show some sort of humanity or you could sometimes even photograph you know just stuff in the street. Um, this is one great photo by a street photographer named Jesse Marlowe from In Public which is an international street photography collective. He took a photo of a box that looks like a face, and it's just a common object, but the face of the cardboard box has so much emotion, and I felt like on a humanistic basis, I could relate with that. 
And so ultimately the way to shoot street photography, it's very subjective. Um, it depends on your personality, your demeanor. Another big uh, piece of advice I'll give you as a budding street photographer or someone who's already pretty advanced is don't follow the shoulds. Follow the musts, meaning don't, some photographers say you should shoot this way, you should shoot that way, you should do this, you shouldn't do that, blah, blah, blah. Uh, my personal recommendation is I think you must shoot street photography the way it speaks to you, the way that you interact with the world. Um, so for example, if you find yourself as a much more kind of introverted person, you don't really like to talk to strangers, you don't like small talk, that's totally fine. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, a lot of street photographers are quite introverted, like on Ricardo Brisson, where you know, he would prefer not to interact with strangers and shoot more at a distance. Um, he shot with a 50 mil prime lens most of his entire life on a film like that. And that's, that's who he was, and that's how he shot street photography. Uh, on the other hand, um, for me, I thought that you always had to shoot that way because that's you know, what the internet told me. Uh, but what I discovered was my personality, I'm, I'm an extreme extrovert. I love people. I love interacting with strangers. I love hearing people's stories. And so for me, interaction and communication is very important for the way I shoot street photography. So the way I try to shoot street photography, you know, I like to chat people up. Sometimes I'll ask for permission. Sometimes I won't. Um, I would say about 70% of my shots are candid without permission and about 30% are with permission. And generally when I approach street photography, yeah, I, I try to make myself vulnerable to my subjects. And the more open I, uh, the more I open I appear to them and the more friendly I am, the, the more I'm generally to get uh, acceptances when I'm shooting street photography. So in terms of how to shoot street photography, so these are some techniques that I personally use and some tips that I use in my, my daily street photography life. Uh, you don't have to follow what I do. This is just what I do. But I would recommend maybe trying it out if you've never tried it out before. So one of the big tips is work the scene. So the common mistake I think I see a lot of street photographers make is that they only take one shot and they leave. And you know, that's, that's fine. But I think a lot of that way of shooting street photography comes from a, a place of fear that you're either upsetting the person, of knowing the person, and you're just kind of being a general pest. Um, I think as a street photographer, don't think that you're just out there like a peeping Tom and you're doing something wrong. Think that as a street photographer, your job and your mission is to document these moments uh, in life and to essentially show the inherent beauty of everyday life. And therefore, by having the social obligation to capture these moments, I think that will give you more confidence to stick with the scene and to make multiple photographs because very rarely is one photo of the scene good enough. There's often always room for improvement. And one thing that I find in street photography is that if you just take one photo and you leave, oftentimes you have a lot of regrets for not having taken more because once you see a scene once in your life, you're never going to see the same scene exactly the same way. I mean, it might be a different type of day, the, the people are going to be different, the expressions are going to be different. And so I'll show you guys some different uh, photographs. So this is one photograph I shot in SF. Um, this is a part of my quote ongoing suits project. And I uh, saw this guy, and he was just kind of hanging out there, and I, I made a bunch of photos, and I'll show you my contact sheets once again. So when it comes to working the scene, um, you never know, oops, you never know if the first photo is going to be the best, the, be uh, the last one's going to be the best, or something in between. Um, if you look at the progression of images, the first image, I saw, I saw him, and you know, I'm working on my suits project, so I see a guy in a suit, I'm like, this is perfect, so I just take one photo, click, take a step closer, click, and then I get a take a step closer, click, and then another practical tip I'll give you in street photography is one way to make better street photos is look for hand gestures and body language. So having his fingers combing his hair was uh, a sign maybe of stress, anxiety, whatnot, and so I made that photo, and you know, his brushing his hair, again, click. And then he notices my presence, and then he's kind of pulling at his tie and makes that very strong eye contact. And through this eye contact, I feel like I could sense his stress, his anxiety, his frustrations, and you know, also maybe him just like kind of being curious or kind of pissed off at me for making the image. And then I even take a step closer, click, and that's the last shot. Uh, for the longest time, I wasn't sure if I liked which of these shots I liked. And so the benefit of taking more than one photograph is when you're out shooting on the streets, you don't know what the best photograph is going to be. Um, 
I'm a big advocate against quote cool chimping, which is when you're shooting on a digital camera and after taking each photo you look at your LCD screen. It's almost like a bad nicotine habit and trust me, I, I do it a lot too. Um, the, the problem about chimping is that it kills the flow when you're shooting street photography. I think when you're out shooting, you should only focus on the shooting. Then when you go home, focus on editing, meaning choosing your best images. When you're out shooting and then you're kind of trying to figure out which photo you're going to keep, it kills the flow. So once again, take all the shots in the beginning, then go home and work it up uh, afterwards. And I'll show you guys some other contact sheets um, of stuff uh, behind the scenes to kind of give you a better sense. So um, I showed you this photograph. Um, so look at the photo. and. One thing which I think makes a quote unquote great street photograph is uh, what I like to call a cherry on top. So imagine a nice ice cream sundae, you have the banana, the ice cream, the chocolate syrup, and on top, whoop, you put the little cherry on top. It's a small detail which makes you know, a good photograph into a great photograph. So look in this photo, what do you think is the cherry on top? Hmm. So for me, it's the girl's shadow. It looks like a Pinocchio nose. Um, and the way that I made the photograph, I'll show you guys the contact sheet. So I was, I was actually in downtown Los Angeles. Here's the contact sheet. Right? So you can see how many photos I make. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 14, 6, 15, 16, 18. Okay. So I'm very obsessive that uh, I try to shoot as much as I possibly can because even subtle little differences in gestures could make or break a photograph. And so I'm doing a workshop in LA, and one of my students actually approached um, this girl and asked to take portraits of her. And from the side, I see that she had this uh, Pinocchio nose shadow. So I just got really close, and I just started blasting away. And so I'll show you the context. So this is one of the first, two, three, four. I think this was the shot, five. And you can see very subtle differences in terms of perspective, make or break the shot. She's looking up, just smiling. Nope, 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 nope. And I get closer, closer, because you don't know. But essentially, the best shot was kind of something in between. Um, another photograph I, I took out recently, which I quite like, is this uh, this guy here. I like the look of Melon calling his face, and also the fact that you have this poster of this woman looking onto her. So I think also street photography, the background is that, is that important as a subject. So when you're shooting, my general tip is, if you see somebody interesting, either you got permission or let's say you haven't, try to look at the background while you're shooting. So just make sure to toss your subject somewhere in the center of the frame or a little bit off to the side. And when you're clicking, don't consciously look at your subject, look at the background because I think oftentimes what we do as street photographers is you look for an interesting subject, we just get carried away. So, oh wow, it's a guy with a pink afro, you start shooting him. But in the background, it's just cluttered. So try to look at the background when you're shooting and also when you're shooting, Look at the edges of the frame. So for this photograph, I'll show you guys uh, the contact sheet. All right. And let's see, where's my contact? Okay, here it is. So for, you can see um, with my street photography, it, yeah, like if I see a really good scene, I'll, I'll work it. Um, I recently took a Magnum workshop with uh, photographer David Allen Harvey. One of the best takeaway points I got from that workshop was when you're out shooting street photography, you could go an entire day and only see three interesting situations or, or potential decisive moments. Once you see one of those three scenes, photograph the hell out of the photographs, meaning uh, don't go out shooting, you know, just taking one or two photos of everything you see. Kind of be selective of what you decide to shoot, but once you found that scene that you find so fascinating and interesting, take like 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 photos, um, especially if you're shooting digital, there's really no downside to taking extra photographs because you know it doesn't cost anything. But even with film, um, currently I'm shooting with a Leica MP film camera. I shoot about 90% of my work on film, about 10% digital. And uh, this one was actually shot digitally on the Ricoh GR as well. So you, know, you see a good scene, like really, really work the scene. And so you can see um, the progression of images. Uh, first, put, series of images, I, I try to capture the dramatic light. The second series of images, you know, he's still really aware of me. And another tip is, if you ask for permission, the more time you spend with your subject, often the more they become relaxed. And so you could see 
towards the end of this, this series, um, I was able to get the ideal shot um, with, with the flash. And even afterwards, I took a, a photo of just his hands. Um, that's another practical tip is, this is one of the last scenes of him, is you, know, you don't always have to photograph people's faces. Sometimes uh, when people don't want their faces photographed, you can just say, oh, do you mind if I take a photo of your hands? And sometimes people's hands could be actually more expressive than um, their faces. And you could see, once again, here's, here's that shot. So skipping ahead again. Another tip I have when it comes to shooting street photography is don't hesitate. Uh, just think to yourself. So for those of you guys who have shot street photography before, have you ever seen a great scene and you want to take the photo, but you think to yourself, oh, you know, I don't know if I might piss off the person, if they're going to get angry at me, if they're going to call the cops, blah, 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 right? And therefore, you, you start overanalyzing the scene and you just don't take the photo. So this has happened a lot to me as well. Um, there's a saying which is paralysis by analysis, meaning the more you analyze a scene, the more you become paralyzed and don't do anything. My approach in street photography is you kind of want to be, <laughs> when you're out shooting, you, you don't want to think too much. You almost want to be like a pigeon, right? Like when I'm out shooting, I'm like, ooh, shiny. <laughs> and then I'll go over to it and just start making photos. Because if you intel over intellectualize when you're out shooting the street, you often talk yourself out of making certain images. And another thing I want to talk about is the whole fear factor. Because when you see a scene and you feel fear, Often, I used, uh, in the past, I used to think that, oh, my fear is something that I want to totally get rid of and extinguish because fear is bad. There's no rational reason to be afraid, blah, blah, blah. But nowadays, I've learned how to channel my fears in a positive way in street photography, meaning um, there are certain days when I'm out shooting where I'll go an entire day, like eight hours walking around. I don't see anything interesting. But the moment I see something, and I feel like my heart's starting to beat, I feel the cold sweats, and I start feeling very nervous, that's my body telling me, Eric, this is a really interesting scene. The reason why you know it's an interesting scene is because you're nervous and scared. You have the fear. But this fear is a sign for you that you must take the photograph. <laughs> so, of course, easier said than that. But if you ever are afraid to make a photo, you have to make the photo because that's your body telling you that it's interesting or it might be interesting. And so, oops, run out of space. Um, and so, if you see a good, if you see a good scene, don't hesitate. Essentially, um, and this in this scene, I saw this very interesting. Um, uh, I was in I was in Lansing, Michigan, and there was this uh, this really great scene. Uh, I saw this board couple, and of course, I'm working on my cool cool suits project, and I see this board couple and this poster of people having a jolly good time. Uh, I had my, my Leica around my neck and I had my flash with me. And I saw this thing, I'm like, oh my god, this is perfect. And I put my flash onto full power and I just made one photograph. And this is also just kind of a side note, but sometimes uh, one, of the, one of the big tips I give photographers is buy books, not gear, because the more photography books you invest in and the more you invest in your education, the better photography you'll, you'll become because you build a dictionary and uh, an encyclopedia of images in your mind. So when I saw this scene, I instantly thought of this scene from photographer Martin Parr from his, his series, The Last Resort. And, you know, you could kind of see, you know, it's not exactly the same photograph, but it has traces of a similar concept where board couple, and so when I saw this photo, I referenced this. But anyways, it's, it's, it's slightly different in that regard. But I, I made the photo with the full flash, uh, it was quite dark, and they were just obviously very stirred. And they look at me, and I look at them, and I go, cool place, huh? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it is a pretty cool place. And I said, okay, enjoy your dinner, have fun. And I, I moved on. So this is another tip uh, I'll talk about in a second. But sometimes when you're photographing, um, pretend like you're shooting something behind the subject or you're photographing you know, the environment, and therefore people are often a lot less uh, intimidated and afraid. Another practical piece of advice I would give is don't be afraid to ask for permission because I think when you're start, starting off in street photography, let's say you're deathly afraid, one of the best ways to start you know, getting more comfortable in your own skin, it's like kind of training wheels, asking for permission. And the good thing about asking for permission is that if you, if you, have, if you ask for permission, people can't really get pissed off at you, meaning you know, 
if you go up to someone and say, oh, excuse me, I think you look really cool. Do you mind if I make your photo? And they're like, no, screw off. They're not going to punch you in the face after that because, you know, you ask for permission. And, in fact, I actually think that asking for permission is more difficult than uh, doing shots candidly because you make yourself more vulnerable. It's, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's easy to just take a candid photo of somebody without permission, but to approach somebody, you know, have the chance to get rejected, it's quite scary. So, um, and also know that one thing in street photography is that street photography is subjective and doesn't tell you the truth. Uh, street photography, I don't think, as a street photographer, I don't think you have the same ethical boundaries of, let's say, a photojournalist or documentary photography where you're trying to show some sort of, quote, quote, objective reality. I think our role as street photographers is to interpret our own reality, and everything we create is subjective. And street photography, I don't think, has to tell the truth. It, a lot of street photography is lies or is uh, misinterpreted. So looking at this photo, um, a photo I took in Tucson, Arizona, what do you think is the expression on her face? So a lot of people look at this photo and say, like, wow, Eric, you're, you're totally an asshole. You approached this nice old lady, you just took a flash of her in the face, and you know, you're such a rude jerk, blah, blah. Uh, the reality is this photo um, was actually shot with permission. Uh, this is the, the contact sheet. And so uh, I'll just tell you guys the story behind the photograph. I'm standing in line about to order a euro, <laughs> and um, I see this woman from the corner of my eye. I'm like, oh, my God, this lady is amazing. And needless to say, I was a little bit nervous because, I don't know, sometimes you sometimes have that fear, right? But I knew to myself, if I don't approach her now and if I don't photograph her, I'm going to regret it. And so I go up to her and I say, oh, my God, excuse me, miss, I love your red hair, your pink out, uh, your yellow outfit. Uh, do you mind if I made a photo of you? And she goes, do oh, Asian people love to take my photo? Yeah, sure, why not? And so I'm like, yes, we do. And sometimes when you ask for permission, one of the, the things your subject will ask you is, uh, what, what do you want me to do? And I wasn't quite, quite sure, so I just said, I don't know, just uh, show me your fingernail. So this is the first photo. The second photo, she's like, what's going on here? The third photo, she's kind of blinking her eyes. And the, the fourth photo, she goes, well, how does my lipstick look? And she's kind of <laughs> playing with her lipstick. And now I made this photo. And little did I know that this was going to be the, the most interesting photograph. And so even though you shoot photos with permission, what I'm looking for isn't just people looking into the camera and up the peace sign. What I'm looking is for those in-between moments where people drop their guard and kind of gives you a more genuine in-between, um, the what Jeffrey Dyer calls the quote-unquote unguarded moment where people just aren't giving you the peace sign. And if you guys are curious, I shoot a lot with a flash. And the reason is, you know, I'll just show you, right? Without a flash, with a flash. So it kind of gives you this surreal um, look that also creates separation between your subject and background. And also if you're shooting color, it adds more color and saturation as well. So, and I shot two without a flash just because, you know, I wasn't sure, you know, oh, natural light, but Often I actually quite like the, the the look of flash, and one of my big inspirations is Martin Parr. Uh, if you guys don't know his work, check it out. Uh, another practical piece of advice is when you're taking photos of strangers, and let's say you ask for permission. Um, <laughs> this sounds so cynical, but I really don't like photos of people smiling <laughs> for the most part. Um, I'm a generally pretty smiley, happy person, but I don't like when people are smiling because it just seems a little bit too contrived and too forced. Um, Often, most people, when they're walking the streets, aren't smiling. So what, one thing I'll try to do is just ask my subjects specifically not to smile. And so, you know, this photograph, uh, take a look at it, uh, shot in Istanbul. What's the look on his face? You know, you guys are probably thinking of stories in your own head. Um, <laughs> and, you know, most people, when they look at this photo, say, wow, this guy looks like he's going to kill you. He has a look of death in his face. Uh, it looks like a candy shop, but the reality is <laughs> he was actually a really happy, friendly guy. Um, and uh, I'll tell you the story behind this photo. So, you know, I'm in a crowded metro or the bus in Istanbul. I see this group of people. I just turn around and have my camera. Before I take the photo, everyone looks at me and like, oh, this Asian guy is crazy. Uh, I took a photo with a flash and everyone's laughing. And specifically what I told him was, look at the camera and don't smile. So I said, look at me. Serious. Mm. And the second photo is kind of trying to suppress his laughter. And by the third photo, 
everyone just starts to ignore me and go back to their own business, and then he gives me a very serious looking face. So, you know, some people are like, oh, but Eric, this photo is pose, the stage is not authentic, blah, blah. For me, once again, I'm not so interested in authenticity of the moment. I'm interested in creating my own subjective view of the world because th th that's, that's what I'm interested in. I'm, um, I'm trying to constantly interpret my own reality. And even though I'm a happy-go-lucky person in a day-to-day -day basis, I'm kind of a social cynic. I, I study sociology in school. And often my photography is kind of dark and depressing, and I think that reflects in terms of how I see people in society. Uh, another practical tip is when you're shooting street photography, um, if you want to shoot more candidly and don't want to be detected, so you just pretend like you're shooting some kind of subject. So I see this woman in uh, New York City, and I see this poster of a man's face looking over her shoulder. Um, and I just quickly took one photo with a flash, um, moved on, and you know, I see from behind me, this woman turns around to wonder what I phot photographed, and she just assumed I photographed this, uh, this poster. Uh, I was very lucky with this photograph, where the flash actually um, reflected in the eye, so it kind of gives you that surreal look. Uh, another thing about street photography is that a lot of street photography is luck, but one, t uh, one quote that I really like is by a Roman philosopher named Seneca, who says, luck is when preparation meets opportunity, meaning uh, the preparation you put in street photography, meaning the time you go out, the time you spend studying photography books, the time you spend studying composition, this is all the preparatory work of street photography, but the opportunity is the right person at the right light in the right place, and that's something you can't really control. So in street photography, you could control the amount of effort you put into it, but you can't really control whether or not you're going to get a good photograph. So it's kind of like fishing, right? You can spend an entire day fishing, right, but not catch any fish. Other days, you spend very little effort fishing, but you catch a lot of fish. Um, whether or not you're going to catch a lot of fish, some of the control lies within you, some of it, a lot of it doesn't. Um, another, so to segue, I wanted to share some you know, tips, lessons, and traits of great street photographers I, I truly admire, and practical tips um, that I, I've learned from them that I think you could apply to your photography as well. So. One of the important things in street photography, so I've been, I've been shooting street photography for about eight, nine years now, um, and it's been a constant journey and an evolution. And I've learned so much and I've changed so much. And I think the problem with social media and photography nowadays is that it's all about instant gratification, right? So, you know, we want to quickly upload a photo, get lots of likes or favorites, and feel loved and go to sleep. And every single day it's kind of the social media treadmill where you're constantly trying to upload images, and if you don't get enough likes and favorites, you feel depressed, and I know it because it happens with me. And one of the things I, I've thought is all the really great photographers I admire and the work that I admire is generally in book format, meaning there are very few photographers on Flickr or Instagram that, whose work really has a longevity to it. And so I think we're, thinking long-term is something that's very important. Uh, if you Google my blog, which is you know Eric Kim blog, there's a section which is uh, learn from the masters. If you go to the start here page, you can find. But you know, almost all the great photographers, they'll work on books or project, long-term projects. They'll take anywhere from like five to ten years, sometimes even a lifetime. And I feel that if you think long-term, it causes a lot less anxiety and frustration as you as a photographer in terms of the day-to-day -day or even the month-to-month. -month. Because if you think about working on, let's say, a photography book, um, generally I think. I prefer photography books with about 40 to 50 images, right, which is pretty reasonable, I think. Anything more than that, I think, is just a little bit too overwhelming. And in street photography, I think for most street photographers I know, if you could at least make one good street photo a month, you're doing really well. So 12 good street photos in a year, you're doing really well. So assuming you have those numbers, that means you know, 12 good photos in a year, then about three or four years, you should be able to make a book. And I think you know, time flies pretty quickly. So uh, this is one series that I really admire. It's from this photographer named Joseph Kudelka, magnum photographer. He did a series on, um, on gypsies, uh, aka the, the Roma people. And one thing I love about this series is that he really kind of lived a dance and breathe uh, with his people for about 10 years. And granted, a lot of us have jobs and obligations and stuff. We can't do this. But, you know, Kudelka is the type of photographer that every five to ten years he puts out a big body of work, and it's amazing. Um, contrast that to the photographer on Instagram who's uploading photos every single day. So 
don't feel pressured to always put photos out every single day. I think it is a good practice to shoot every day, but not every day are you going to make a good photo. So try to, to share less. Uh, one thing I love about this photo is the nice uh, triangle composition. So can you see the triangle? So you see the kid in the center, the kid left and right. Uh, this is one compositional technique Kudelka uses a lot in the Sipsis project. Um, this is a funny quote from Kudelka. So when he was <laughs> doing the Gypsies project, he was so poor that often the Gypsies felt bad for him. And, you know, <laughs> this is, shows the amount of dedication that he really put into uh, to the series. And another thing that I learned from Kudelka is a lot of his photos, you know, they're poses essentially. Like this photo, I'm sure he took all, told all three of these kids to stand this way. This photo, I'm sure he told this guy to sit here in this certain way. Um, with these uh, ornaments, and you can see this nice triangle composition. And just because, and I think there's this bias against pose photographs that, like, oh, because a photo's pose, it inherently has less value. I would disagree. I would actually say that asking someone to pose for you and making a good photo out of it is probably one of the most difficult things for the, any of those who's, uh, of you guys who have ever shot portrait photography. To get a natural pose photo of somebody is actually one of the most challenging things. Uh, this is a nice, another nice quote for Kudelka is, I'm willing to show my photos, not so much my contact prints. I often work on small prints. I look at them frequently and for a long time. I put them up on my wall and compare them to make sure of my choice. And once again, looking at your photos for a long time, this is one technique I like to call marinating your photos, is that if you want to cook a really nice steak, you don't just take a steak out of the freezer and just plop it on the frying pan. No. You let it soak in the juices overnight for a very long period of time. And often, the longer you let your photos sit, the better your photos become. And so generally, my gen uh, general guidelines for photographers is that, let's say you shoot digital. After you take the photos, yeah, sure, download them to Lightroom. But try to wait at least a week before looking at them, maybe even waiting a month before publishing them. And I think this often gives you enough emotional distance from your photographs to be more objective when it comes to judging them. Uh, personally, I shoot film. I don't develop my photos uh, three to three months to six months to so sometimes a year at a time because it really helps me emotionally distance myself from my photographs. Uh, another great photo from Kudelka's Gypsies project. I love the spacing of the three subjects. And if you look at the leading line of the, the wallpaper in the back, they connect all these three of the heads perfectly. And I can bet you that, you know, for the kid in the bottom right corner, he saw this leading line. He said, hey, kid, stand over there. And he ended up making a really great photograph. Another good uh, quote from Kudelka, when I wake up in the morning and I feel good, I tell myself, today may be the last day of my life. That is my sense of urgency, but I keep wondering about what you just said, that I'm not a conscience. People have told me that. People much younger have told me, I wish to work like you. So no, this was an excerpt from the interview, but essentially um, Kudelka is like in the 70s now and he still shoots constantly with a passion. And I think having this hunger for photography, sometimes like reminding yourself of your own death is a good way to stay motivated, especially in the long term. Um, it kind of reminds me of the Steve Jobs quote where every day he looks, he wakes up, looks in the mirror, thinks that if this is the last day I live, will I live a life without regrets? Another tip I give to you in your photography is that, you know, imagine yourself as an 80 or a 90 year old on your deathbed thinking, what regrets will I have in my photographic life? And I think constantly think about your death and your mortality is actually a good way to stay motivated. Uh, another good photo by Kudelka. What I love about the photo is the minimalism of the shot and the way that man looks like he's almost talking to the horse. Uh, another piece of advice from Kudelka. I am not interested in repetition. I don't want to reach a point where I don't, I wouldn't know how to go further. It's good to set limits for oneself, but there comes a moment where we destroy what we have constructed. And so applying this to your photography, yeah, like, you know, a lot of street photographers, fall into mediocrity where they're just constantly repeating themselves. Um, when you're a street photographer starting off, one technique a lot of photographers do, which I also did, is you know you find an interesting background or a poster and just wait for people to walk into the photo. And you know it's a good way to get started in street photography, but you just keep doing that over and over again for years and years. You know, you're just repeating yourself and it's not interesting. So always think about the way that you could constantly push yourself forward and have small progression in your work to create a, a unique body of work. Um, Another tip is when you're shooting street photography or uh, photos in general, try to figure out who the primary subject is. Um, 
I think the best photos often have one strong singular subject. So in this photograph, I think it's that girl who is kind of in the center of the frame, and she's looking straight at you, and everyone else is looking outside of the frame, and having that white space around her is essential for the separation. Another quote by Kodelka, I don't care what people think. I know well enough why. I refuse to become a slave to their ideas. When you stay in the same place for a certain time, people put you in a box and expect you to stay there. Another big tip I'll give you in your photography is, at the end of the day, you want to photograph to please yourself. Um, I know a lot of photographers who, once again, fall into the social media treadmill where they're so addicted to the likes and favorites that they're, all, they're making photos to please their audience rather than to please themselves. So just imagine that no one can look at your photos and make photos that please yourself or else you're not going to please anybody. And once again, Kodelka, I always photograph with the idea that no one would be interested in my photos, that no one would pay me, that if I did it, uh, if I did something, I only did it for myself. I think there's a lot of photographers who, you know, a lot of us have day jobs, families, other obligations. I don't think you need to be a full-time photographer to be a great photographer. Uh, in fact, sometimes it is good to have a, a day job because your photography is purely your passion, your hobby. And one of the problems about professional photographers is that if you get too much of your professional work tied up with your passion, you lose that passion. And you don't want to corrupt your, your artistic work. And so, once again, you should shoot as if you'll never become famous, you'll never have a show, you'll never sell a print, whatever, but as long as you're able to deeply fulfill that part of yourself, I think you're living an amazing life. Another quote, quote, I photographed only something that has to do with me, and I never did anything I did not want to do, so he didn't end up doing any editorial and advertising. No, my freedom is not something I want to give away easily. So once again, follow your gut. Uh, another important trait of you know, really great photographers is not settling, meaning don't be satisfied. And this kind of goes back to the point of working the scene. So one photographer, Trent Park in Australia, an amazing photo um, he took. Essentially the way he photographed it was, you know, it's during sunset and there's a bus that was passing and he was able to get all these shadows on top of it. And it's a very surreal photo. There's a very lengthy description here of how he shot it, but long story short, um, you know, he photographed the same spot three or four times a week for a month. And he shot nearly a hundred rolls of film to just get that one image, to get this one photograph. A <laughs> hundred rolls of film, remind you, this costs a lot of money. Uh, and so if you shoot digital, use that to your advantage. Don't just take one or two shots. And don't be satisfied. If you think you got the shot, you probably haven't got the shot yet. So just keep hustling and try to get the best possible photo you can. This is another photograph he shot. This is a quite interesting technique where he exposed for the shadows and once somebody stepped into the to the highlight, it just kind of blew him out and it kind of gives him that surreal looking, mysterious ghostly look. One nice quote by Trent. If I can't go 100% at something, it's over. I need to live what I do from the moment I get up to the moment I fall asleep. I didn't play sport to become average. I played to be the best I could be. It's not about winning or losing. It's about making sure that you're giving your best shot with the abilities you have been granted. So Trent Park was actually a professional um, uh, athlete before he got into photography. And, you know, it's not a matter of becoming the best in the world. It's a matter of becoming the best you possibly can, given your abilities and your experiences. And so in photography, you know, not all of us could just quit our job and become full-time photographers, but given your constraints, how can you every single day make the best effort you can to always carry your camera with you, to always give it your all, and to not settle when you're out shooting? Another wonderful photo by Trent Park. Once again, um, he's always photographing light and shadows and mystery, and his photos have a great sense of soul and mystery to them. Um, and one other trait about him is that he's always seeing that if you could make something even a little bit better so it doesn't just settle. So essentially in this quote he's talking about, okay, you know, I made a good photo, but how can I even make even a better photograph? And so he constantly pushed himself, pushed himself, pushed himself. He doesn't, he doesn't settle. He tries to constantly reinvent himself and make better images. Another lovely photo of um, the rain that he captures in Australia with that beautiful light. And also another thing he talks about in street photography is that he doesn't, he's not just there just trying to be a street photographer. He's, he's trying to push the entire medium of photography forward. And he's not happy with just making photos that have been done before, but he wants to make images that no one has seen before. Is that he wants to make photos that just transcend 
typical street photography. And, you know, a lot of these photographers wouldn't call themselves street photographers per se, but I think their working methods and their passion is something that deeply inspires me in street photography. Uh, the last trait, I think, which makes a really great street photographer or a great photographer or human being is drawing inspiration from other fields. So there's one photographer named Sebastio Salgado, and he's not a street photographer. He's, a, he's more of a documentary photographer, and he travels the world and he photographs um, kind of social, political, economic issues. So one of the big things is that he photographed um, Kuwaiti uh, oil fields. And interesting history of Sebastio Salgado. He actually started off as an economist, and when he discovered photography was a much better way for him to express the injustices of economic condition, working conditions of workers, he decided to pursue photography full time. And he, he, he writes, my, my pictures gave me 10 times more pleasure than the reports I was working on when he was in economics. To be a photographer was, for me, an incredible way to express myself, an incredible way to see the world from another point. And so often I think the best street photographers or best photographers aren't the ones who just started off in photography, but they have other fields that have inspired them. So some of the best street photographers I know have studied graphic design, and therefore the street photos are very visual. Other street photographers I know who love jazz music, and their photos have a great beat, a great rhythm, and the sense of improvisation to them. And with Sebastian Sagato, studying as an economist, his photos have a very you know, economic perspective to it. Another photograph he took of the gold mines. You could just see all these people in the mines and just obviously these horrid working conditions. And he's, the people look more like ants and human beings. And he's photographing a lot of these uh, social injustices in his work to raise awareness. Um, and he talks a little bit about the importance of not just going to photography, but other fields. So he recommends studying history, geopolitics, sociology, and anthropology to understand the society that we're a part of and to understand yourself and where you're in. Uh, in order to make choices. And a lot of photographers talk a lot about technical settings. I think technical settings are very easy to learn. You can learn them on the internet or YouTube. But learning more about the knowledge of the world and how you fit into the grand scheme of things, I think is much more important. Another very beautiful photograph is taken. Um, and you could just see the movement and the expression of the people in the background in Ethiopia. And he talks also about subjectivity in photography. Photography is not objective. It is deeply subjective. My photography is consistent ideological and ethically with the person that I am. I think the best photos, uh, the best photographers are the ones where you look at their images. And it's not just you looking at their images, but it's you looking at who they are as a human being and how they see the world. Once again, um, another great, powerful thing about Sebastian Salgado's photos is the emotion, the expressions they get from people. And you go look at the way, the way this woman is holding her head. You can just feel her pain and suffering. And he talks about style. Uh, I don't believe a person has a style. What people have is a way of photographing what is inside them, what there has come out. Um, I do a lot of workshops in terms of helping people discover their own style in street photography. And I think style isn't just how your photos look, but it's how you see the world and who you are as a human being. So once again, in street photography, shoot who you are. Shoot the way that you see the world, the way that makes you feel comfortable, and make photos that express how is it that I see the world that is unique from other people? And sharing your subjective view of the world is something very important. Um, another photo during the oil wells in Kuwait, you could just kind of get a sense of the desperation, the frustration, the exhaustion of this man just covered in this oil. It just must feel horrible. Uh, Sebastian Sagal also works on long-term projects. And he just talks about that You know, often the more time you spend on a project, the deeper you understand it, the more you could relate with people and the environment. And not just trying to make photos that, you know, are just going to get a lot of likes on Facebook or Flickr, but photos that are going to be something more intimate and say more about society and the world. And um, to kind of conclude, um, so, you know, thank you so much guys so far for uh, spending your time with me. And these are some basic street photography assignments that I often give out workshops, and I think you would also use to practice your street photography. So, first assignment, uh, compliment everybody for a day. Um, I think one of the things that people don't do enough of is compliment each other. So, um, I've made it a personal you know, habit of mine too. Whenever I see somebody that I like, 
or has a certain outfit or shoes or a certain look that I like, I always give them a compliment. So, um, you know, for example, my partner Cindy, she looks great. I'm like, I love your, I love your outfit for today. You look beautiful. If I'm at a restaurant and I'm ordering and the waiter or waitress has a nice ring or watch, I'll compliment them. Um, if I meet a photographer whose photos I like, I'll, I'll give them a compliment. So one of the tips in street photography is, you know, before you take a photo of your subject, give them a compliment. And, you know, for this photo in downtown LA, I told him I liked his outfit and he ended up letting me take his photos. And so the more you compliment people, even with or without a camera, this will help build your confidence and your sociability to make other people feel more comfortable and willing to be photographed. Because oftentimes, people don't know why you want to photograph them, but if you compliment them, they get a better sense of why you want to photograph them. Um, the next one is the five yes, five no challenge. So I think a lot of street photographers have a fear of rejection in street photography, meaning they're afraid of people saying no to being photographed. The concept of the project is you go out for an entire day, um, you essentially ask a bunch of people permission to shoot their photo, and you need five people to say yes, and five people to say no, meaning if you get five people to say yes, 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 okay. Now you have to purposely look for the five scariest looking people out there who will purposely reject you. <laughs> and the funny thing about this assignment is sometimes you approach people who you are 100% sure will say no, but end up saying yes. And the last one I got from my friend uh, Satoki Nagata, a very talented street photographer in Chicago, is called the 0.7 meter challenge. So 0.7 meters is about two or three feet. Um, it's actually the minimum focusing distance on a Leica. The concept is for an entire day or a week or a month, pre-focus your lens to 0.7 meters or the minimum focusing distance on your camera and only shoot that distance because I feel that when you're restricted with a certain close distance, it'll make you more comfortable at working at a closer proximity with your subjects. And so with this photo, I shot this on the Ricoh GR, actually in macro mode, and I must have been actually, for this photo, maybe 0.2 meters away or 20 centimeters away uh, or less than a foot. So often, if your photos aren't good enough, you're not close enough, the Robert Capper quote. So always try to get closer when you're shooting. And um, yeah, I guess maybe we could transition into uh, question and answers, and thank you guys so much for listening. So I'm going to take a look thank at the question. You, Eric, actually, I can read you some questions from the audience if you'd like. Um, oh, we have one. Yeah, we have one from Edward. If you would love to know, first of all, that he commented that your photos are generally really well exposed. How mm -hmm. often do you use the flash, and is it on or off your camera? Okay, so question about the flash. Um, great question. So. Uh, currently, I shoot with a, a Leica MP camera uh, with a Leica SF20 flash and a 35 millimeter lens. The flash is permanently glued onto my camera. Uh, generally, when it comes to shooting with a flash, I shoot it fully, uh, sh shoot it fully manually. Um, the settings I use is I'll generally shoot the majority of my photos at about 1.2 meters, which is about three or four feet. Uh, keep my aperture around f/8. Uh, my shutter speed about 50th of a second, which is um, the sh the the, the flash sync of a film Leica, and I'm using ISO 200, uh, 400 film, and on the back of the camera I could manually control the power of the flash, so I'll generally have it at minimum power, which is about 1.7 meters, and I found that if I'm shooting at that um, power, any of my subjects about 1.2 meters away uh, will be well exposed. If my subjects are a little bit closer, I'll adjust the focus and put it to f11. If they're really, really close, I'll shoot f16, if they're a little bit further away, um, I'll adjust the, uh, the, the power on the back of the flash and I'll make a full power, which will give me about five meters at F8. Generally, when it comes to technical exposures, uh, when it comes to digital, on my Ricoh GR, I actually just shoot in P mode, which is program mode. It's essentially a step up from auto mode, and I'll just, it's, I'll just keep it really simple. I'll just use the little pop-up flash that's integrated into the camera. And yeah, P mode will automatically choose a shutter speed, aperture, um, and the ISO I usually keep around 1600, and I always shoot raw mode. Um, to me, getting a good exposure in camera isn't as important as capturing the moment, so I recommend everyone to use you know raw if you're shooting uh, shooting digital, and it's always fine to adjust the exposure afterwards. And also, you don't have to shoot fully manual either. I think there's a misconception that oh, just because a photo was shot fully manually makes it a better photo. I don't I don't agree. Some of the best magnet photographers out there actually shoot in P mode as well. And sometimes people say, oh, ha, ha, P for professional. But yeah, like 
if you make a really great photo, no one's gonna look at your photo and be like, oh, did you shoot that in P mode or fully manually? No one's gonna care. They only care about the image. Awesome. Uh, okay. Next so Yuri would like to know, with regards to flash, and when you're shooting color, is it better with flash or better without? So uh, personally, I think flash is much more awesome um, with color. So once again, the, the distinction is this is a shot with flash, without flash. And I guess it comes down to personal taste. For me, um, I prefer the look with flash because it adds more saturation. It adds more pop. Um, Natural light is often great too, but um, this is this is also another pragmatic reason I like to shoot with a flash is that there's only two times a day when light's actually very, very good. It's uh, sunrise and sunset, golden hour, right? If the light is very, very good, I don't use a flash. I, I try to shoot natural light. But 99% of the time, in between during the day, the light is too harsh. And so when I'm shooting with a flash, I'm usually trying to shoot people in the shade or trying to shoot people indoors. If someone's um, in the bright sunlight and it's really, really harsh, I'll generally just shoot without a flash. Um, but generally, uh, when it comes to shooting with a, a flash, I would recommend people shooting in the shade. Um, but if you have a camera that has more manual settings, you could also shoot with a flash in the bright sunlight. What you essentially do is you put your camera to like ISO 100, and then here using manual is better, where you're exposing the background, but then using the, uh, the flash to fill in your subject. And so uh, some photographers I recommend to check out is Martin Parr, who does that really well. But because my flash is on my film like at only 50th of a second, essentially I'm limited to only photographing people in the shade, not in the bright sunlight. More questions? OK, Ziv and Bernie would like to know first how you handle release forms and if you need permission to use the actual photos of the people you're taking. OK, great question. So. Um, when it comes to capturing, uh, getting release forms, when it comes to photographing your subjects, you only need a release form if it's going to be used for advertorial purposes. Meaning, if you photograph a subject and you're going to put on a Pepsi, let's say, then you need a release form. But let's say if you want to put an exhibition, let's say you want to sell a book or sell prints, you actually don't need a release form. Um, in terms of the legality of street photography, um, of course, it di differs in each country, but about most countries out there, um, in America especially, as long as someone's in a public space, you don't actually need their written consent to photograph them because it's a, it's a public space. That's what, um, that's what public means. Um, what you're not allowed to do is uh, photograph somebody inside their home without their permission. Technically, you're also not allowed to shoot indoors in a, in a private space without permission. For me, I still do. I, I was saying uh, it's better to beg for forgiveness and ask for permission. But whenever, you know, since of course you'll photograph some people and say, oh, that's legal and that's actually not true. Um, I think the only countries where it's quote, quote, legal to shoot street photography, and it's, once again, not so black and white, it's very gray. It's uh, Germany, France, and I think, um, let's see, mm, somewhere in Eastern Europe, I forget the, the country, but there it's a lot more difficult to shoot without permission. Um, but even professional photographers, I know there it says it's generally a non-issue. OK, Sebastian would like to know when you're editing your digital photos, do you use a MacBook Air or something else? Do I use a what? Do you use a MacBook Air, or what do you use for ah, editing your okay. photos? Um, OK, so uh, my, my computer currently is an 11-inch MacBook Air. It's, um, I think, a 2000, maybe 2013 model. So it's about two years old already. but. Uh, when I bought it, it was maxed out. It's an i7 processor, 8 gigs of RAM, and uh, I generally have it running off an uh, external hard drive, um, like a you know, I use like a Western Digital USB 3.0, and yeah, it's it's actually really good. And um, yeah, like all my post processing work is done in, um, in Lightroom, and yeah, like <laughs> it's funny. Like I find the MacBook Pro more than enough to, or MacBook Air more than enough to. Uh, post process edit my photos and I'm even able to um, edit videos in Final Cut and iMovie and stuff like that and I generally haven't had any issues. Um, the the digital cameras I've been using most the last two years has been the Ricoh GR and the X100S and T. So the files aren't super big so it's pretty fast but I'd imagine if you're shooting on like a Nikon D800E or something it might be a little more difficult. But personally, that's my main um, device. Yes. 
Okay, and then Edward would like to know regarding focusing on eyes. Doesn't the inherent speed of street photography work against getting the eyes in focus, or do you set a low aperture? Okay, uh, excellent question. So I didn't I didn't talk too much about that, but um, so one technique I recommend in street photography is called zone focusing. So basically, the concept is I set my whenever I'm shooting street photography, my aperture is always from f8 to f16, and then I shoot manual focus manual focus to about, you know, I usually pre-focus about 1.2 meters. And the, and, you know, ISO, assuming you're shooting with a digital camera, I'd keep it pretty high around 3, 1600 to 3200. Uh, you can shoot aperture, priority mode. Uh, and pretty much what I do is, I hate bokeh in street photography. <laughs> it's such a, it's such a funny, it's such a funny quote, but um, you know, uh, don't get me wrong, I like bokeh, I like the nice shallow depth of field, whatever, but I think the common mistake a lot of street photographers make in street photography is that they try to shoot all the photos at 1.4 or f2 or if you're rich enough, an octolog, so 0.95, whatever. But I think in street photography, the reason I'm against shooting wide open, let, let's say 1.4, f1.8 or whatever, is because I think it's kind of a it's kind of a cheap way out in the sense that I think a great photo should have an interesting subject and an interesting background. By shooting wide open, you're just kind of blurring out the background you're just because the background is too distracting. But if you're shooting at F8 to F16, everything's in focus. So therefore, your entire subject's going to be focused. Therefore, his or her eyes will be in focus. And also, the background will be in focus. Everything's in focus. And the reason I recommend shooting with a high ISO even during the day is that you want a really fast shutter speed so you have sharp photos. Um, for me, aesthetically, I like sharp photos. I'm not really a big fan into like panning or blurred photos. I mean, sometimes it does work, but um, by shooting aperture priority at f8, ISO 1600, 3200, ideally you want at least for sure. So ideally, you want your shutter speed to be at least one over two feet per second for sharp photos of people walking. Uh, in a perfect world, you want the fastest shutter speed possible. So ideally, you'd want at least even one over one thousandth of a second um, to have really sharp photos. So this this technique called zone focusing, um, uh, I have a, a YouTube video to search Eric Kim zone focusing and you should be able to learn a little more about settings or watch other people's YouTube videos or go on Google or stuff like that. Okay, and this question is from Carl. Do you find it difficult to interact with your subjects and take pictures at the same time? How would you recommend building this skill? Um, Carl, that's a, a great question. Thank you for asking me that. So, it actually, yeah, so it is it is difficult to interact with your subjects and photograph at the same time. Um, generally, my practical suggestion is come up with a bunch of just kind of generic questions that could be kind of pre-canned. So, I mean, it might seem very impersonal, but like some, some questions you might ask is, you know, like, you know, how was your day? Where are you from? Where did you buy your sunglasses? Whatever, right? And so, generally, whenever I'm talking to people and interacting with them, uh, there's there's several ways I do it. First of all, I can just chat with them for 10 or 15 minutes and then ask them to take the photo, or ask for permission. And while I'm talking with them, I, I'm taking the photos. And generally, one of the, the the tips is I try to make photos of people with their hands close to their face. So. Generally, if I see something interesting about the face, so like, let's say they have really nice curly hair, I'll say, oh, I'm, I love your curly hair, it looks so beautiful, where'd you get it done? And then people will start touching their hair, and they totally forget about the camera, and say, oh, you know, I got a curl at this local place, and then while, I'm, uh, while they're talking, I'm clicking. Or by saying, oh, you know, your sunglasses are so cool, uh, where'd you get those? It puts folks away from them and more onto their accessories, therefore, they're less self-conscious about the camera. Uh, another technique I haven't talked about, but it's also a useful technique in street photography is sometimes people are like, okay, you know, but what if I don't want to, what if I want to capture a more candid moment, but at the same time have my subjects feel more comfortable? My suggestion is if you see somebody interesting, take a photo of them without permission, and then once they've noticed you starting to take photos of them, then you approach them and say, excuse me, miss or mister, you look so cool, do you mind if I made some photos of you? 
And then if people say, no, screw off, then you walk away having already taken the candid photos. But if they end up saying yes, then you could also have them um, shoot portraits of them with permission. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. So this is the shoot first technique and then approach and ask for permission afterwards. Um, yeah. Okay, Jerome would like to know, can you tell us again what kind of cameras you use for the street photography photos you've shown us? Okay, so, um, show it to you guys. Um, so I shot this on a Leica MP camera with a 35 millimeter lens, Portra 400, uh, Ricoh GR, Ricoh GR, this is the newest one, I think you got it on Amazon for about 600 bucks, highly recommended, Ricoh GR, Ricoh GR, uh, Leica MP, so film, this is also film, um, film, you know, and then the, for film, I only use one camera, one lens, one film, Kodak Portrait 400, um, film, let's see. Yeah, um, yeah, also film, film. So uh, for people who are curious about learning more about, you know, let's say you have a big DSLR, you don't like to lug it around, the top two cameras I would recommend are the Fuji Film X100T. Um, this is kind of the best, like, bang for the buck camera. It's essentially a quote, quote, affordable Leica. And the Ricoh GR, which is a pocket camera with the APS-C sensor. And, uh, yeah, currently my main setup is I'll shoot with the Leica MP, and I'll just have the Ricoh GR in my pocket just in case I either run out of film or I need to shoot some really close-up portraits of people. I need to use macro mode. Okay, awesome. And then V would like to know what app you were using to view the photos during the webinar. Uh, sorry, say that again? Which app you were using to view the photos during this webinar? Like that you oh, have open that? right now. To view the photos. Yeah, to view them, like we, that you have up right now. Oh, okay. Uh, well, um, <laughs> So I'm currently using uh, Keynote for the presentation, and um, I'll upload the slides to my blog um, after the webinar. And generally, um, when I look at the photos, I'll use, uh, I always use Adobe Lightroom 5 to uh, manage my library, to look through my photos, um, edit them down, whatnot. But uh, yeah, currently, to look at these photos, I was just using, I use Mac, you know, the, the, Finder, the Finder app, and I just, yeah, just the, the default built-in application. Um, and this is just kind of a general thing, uh, which I think some people might find interesting as well, is that uh, I'll use Lightroom to organize everything and edit and uh, edit my post, I mean, choose my best image and also post-process, but I also make it a practice to, ex once, I'm, once I find photos that I really like, I'll export the photos into um, physical folders on the computer as JPEGs. Right, so this is like my grid and grading series. So I just on my computer I have all these full resolution JPEG images, and then I'll also back them up to like um, I have them all synced on Dropbox. Upload full resolutions to Flickr as well, and also have like about three external hard drives just in case if any of them crash. Okay, Ming Za would like to know, will you still shoot at F8 when you are shooting a portrait with permission? Um, okay, that's, that's a great question. So when, it, when I get permission, um, okay, so for me, I never shoot street portraits or street photography wide open. The only time I ever do is that if it's really dark and I don't want to use a flash for some reason, then I'll shoot F2 at 30th of a second. Um, but for street portraits, I personally never do. Um, I think for other people, it, I think that's fine. Um, so let's say if you're shooting a street portrait, you want to shoot, you should shoot shallow depth of field. I think that's fine because then you have more control of making sure the eyes are in focus and whatnot. But I, I would still say, I would still recommend street photographers, if possible, not to shoot wide open. Maybe if you want a little more separation, yeah, maybe shooting at like 5.6 or maybe f4. Because this is also another problem is that let's say you shoot at 1.4, you'll get the eyes in focus, but the nose or the chin is out of focus. Um, I like to see the whole face in focus. And I think this is also kind of a thing I notice in photography in general is that 
people just shoot wide open to make a photo that's not that interesting more interesting by using a shallow depth of field because everyone loves bokeh. And don't get me wrong, I do too. But um, but yeah, like with my Ricoh GR, um, I'm just shooting a P mode. Also with the Fuji films, I just shoot P mode, which is auto aperture, auto shutter speed. And generally, the camera will default to about f5.6, f8. And on the on the Leica, when I'm shooting close street portraits, I'm still shooting from f8 to f16. Okay, great. Diane would like to know about the workshops that you offer, and if you ever have seniors 65 and older that attend. Oh, so Dan, um, I want to tell you something that's awesome. So, um, generally with my workshops, I've had students as young as 14 and as old as 82. Um, it, was, it was actually pretty amazing. There's, um, yeah, this, this one female photographer, she came from a workshop. Her name was, um, oh, why am I forgetting her name? Um, it'll, it'll come back to me in a second. But she came to my workshop and she was 82 years old. and you know, she had an entire career as a real estate agent, and now she's actually going back to photography school to learn photography. So one of the lessons I want to teach is that, yeah, it's like never too late. Um, this is just random self-promotion, but if you want to just learn more about my workshops, you can just go to my blog or just Google Eric Kim Workshops, and you could kind of click here and see my upcoming schedule. But uh, speaking of age, um, there's also another photographer I highly recommend everyone check out. His name is uh, Jack Simon. Jack Simon, and he's, he's a photographer based in the Bay Area, and he's actually a good friend of mine, very talented street photographer. He's, he just turned 70. Um, he picked up street photography when he was 65, and he's only been shooting for about five years, and he's actually, in my opinion, one of the best contemporary color street photographers. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, yeah, I did a workshop in SF last week, and about half the people were 70 and over. So, uh, yeah, it's never, you're never too old or never too young for street photography, and that's why I love it. It's the most democratic form of photography out there, in my opinion. Gerald would like to know, when shooting digital, how much post-processing do you do, and what software do you use? Okay, so Gerald, um, questions about post-processing. So, I'm actually a big fan of using presets. And there's a saying in photography is that, no matter how much you polish a piece of turd, it's still going to be a piece of turd. So sometimes I actually personally fall into the problem where the more I end up post-processing the photo, the worse the photo looks. So what I generally tend to do is stick to presets and just make small adjustments based on there. So, for example, this one photo of this, um, this lady I shot. Oh, I can show it to you real quick. So let's say, uh, so I'm always, shoot, I'm always shooting raw. I'm just going to reset this. Let's see where I set on for a second. I don't even remember. Okay. So let's say I kind of reset this image, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it looks like, yeah, the, the initial exposure I got is actually quite poor. Um, I, made, I made a ton of presets that I use for my own personal use. If you want to get that for free, just search Eric Kim Lightroom Presets. You just go to my blog and then the first link. I actually have all these free presets. You could download that work in Lightroom 4 and 5. Unfortunately, I don't use anything else. So yeah, you could just download it here. Um, so I think, let's see, which one did I use? I think I used, I don't even remember. Let me, let me see which ones I, which one did I use? Hmm. Okay, but anyways. So let's see what I might use is I'll just kind of scroll through them and find one that looks good. I'm like, okay, um, let's say this one looks good, this Eric Kim Fuji Velvia 400. And I'll just boost up the exposure, use too contrasty. Yeah, this one looks way too yellow. And I think with this one I might have played with the white balance. Yeah, I've set it to auto, adjust it. So you just play. And generally what I do with the sliders is I'll just kind of go, uh, I'll start off with the preset and I'll just go through them one by one, exposure, contrast, and you just kind of play with the highlights maybe. And I just kind of drag these left and right until it looks good to me. And once I'm able to find a quote, quote, look that I like, yeah, so 
good enough. So I, when I post process my photos, I literally try not to take more than like 30 seconds or a minute. Yeah, and then I, I say, okay, I like the shot, and I'll just export it into my library. Um, another tip I have is that when you're out shooting street photography, try to shoot with color of black and white in mind. So one of the tips that I do is um, when I'm importing photos, let's say I'm shooting color, I'll intentionally add a certain um, filter upon preset. Um, and this is especially useful when um, I'm using black and white. So I have like this Neopan 1600 preset. So when I'm importing photos, they look black and white. I'm not, I'm making this decision before I shoot whether I'm only going to shoot color or black and white. I try not to do too much like after the fact where, oh, is this photo going to be better in color or black and white and make the decision afterwards. Um, let's see, okay, this is a series of photos that I shot of this woman in New York City. So you can see I've taken tons of photos of her at different angles and perspectives and just to skip ahead, the best photo I like is of her laughing. So once again, if I reset this photo, this is the original raw photo. I think for this photo, what do I use? Yeah, I might have used one of these. Yeah, I think I use like Velvia version 8. I just make different versions which have slightly different uh, exposures. So I just start from there and say, okay, I look at this photo. Maybe a little bit too contrasted, too much highlights. Maybe I'll try to lower the contrast a bit. Just kind of play with the sliders. That looks good to me. Yeah, that looks decent. Blacks. And a lot of the post-processing is very subjective. I mean, um, and yeah, and everything else I try not to touch. I mean, sometimes when I'm like super specific, uh, I try to use it. Let's say if I was going to be black and white. Yeah, just apply a black and white preset. You know, play with the pre play with the exposures. Just kind of drag these back and forth. So then I just export it as a JPEG. So I really just try not to spend too much time on post processing. But that's that's generally what I do. Uh, my practical tip for photographers too is that spend about ninety nine percent of your time editing, aka choosing your best images, and only one percent of your time post processing your photos. I think most photographers tend to do it the exact opposite way. Okay, Ed and Frankie would both like to know about the lens that you use most frequently for street photography. Okay, so um, the lens that I use is Leica Synchrome. Uh, so I shoot with the film Leica and the lens I currently shoot with is, yeah, the, the Leica F2 Summicron. Um, don't be afraid, this is a very expensive lens. It's the only lens I, I currently own uh, for my film Leica, but it's the, the lens I could safely say I'll own until I die. Um, yeah, and it's, it's F2, it's a, uh, for people who are shooting with Leicas. Um, I don't recommend the 1.4 version because A, it's like $2,000 more expensive and also it's pretty big and heavy. I'm a big fan of pancake prime lenses, uh, lenses that are small, compact. I think a 35 millimeter full frame equivalent is ideal. If you shoot with a, a Fuji, um, the 27, I, I recommend the, yeah, this lens is awesome too. So once again, the camera, the lens doesn't have to be expensive. Um, I'm a huge fan, if you're shooting with a Fuji film, the 27 mil, it's about a 40 mil full frame equivalent. This lens is freaking awesome. If you shoot with a Canon, full frame, digital, the 40 mil pancake lens. This lens is amazing. It's so cheap too. Um, this is good for full frame. And I think also Canon makes, is it Canon 28 mil pancake, I think? Yeah, oh, this, yeah, this new one. This one's awesome. So if you have like a DSLR crop Canon, like a, I don't know, like a, a 500D or something, this lens is also amazing. 24 after the 1.6 crop factor, it's about, I think about a 35-ish, which is good. So I think for 99% of street photographers, I recommend a 35 millimeter full frame equivalent lens. Uh, even when I'm shooting on my Ricoh GR, which is a 28 millimeter full frame equivalent, there's actually this camera setting in camera, which is a 35 millimeter crop mode, which I actually use quite liberally. But uh, yeah, that's that's essentially the, the lens that I use and the only lens I own on my, my Leica. Okay, Yuri would like to know what you consider more important, composition or subject matter? 
Okay, so Yuri, uh, great question. So what's more important, composition or subject matter? Uh, for me, I mean, obviously you need both, but for me at the end of the day, I think uh, subject matter is much more important because uh, this, is, this is a very crude, a very, very, sorry, this is not very PC, but my, my friend uh, Neil, Neil Ta, he has a quote saying, you can't take a bad photo of a burning monk. So there's this very famous photo um, of this uh, Buddhist monk that he was protesting um, the war and essentially he put himself on fire. And it's one of the most powerful images out there. And honestly, anyone with an iPhone or a passerby, anyone could have taken the photo and made a good photo out of it because the, the content matter is just so powerful and such a such a absolutely, you know, kind of a horrifying but at the same time very emotional photo. Just looking at how calm and peaceful he is, the fact that he's just totally just in flames. Um, this is once again out of bad taste, but if you analyze this photo from a compositional standpoint, someone would say, oh, you know, this car in the background is so distracting, you have these poles, you know, maybe he should have shot this at F2 and separated the subject from the background, maybe these guys in the background are so important. And, and so you could see, um, you know, it's one of those things where I think at the end of the day, really, composition isn't as important as um, framing. Um, so, but at the same time, composition is very important because without a good composition, you don't know who the subject is and who to focus on. So ideally, in a perfect world, you want to balance both of them, but I would say at the end of the day, for me, comp, um, subject matter and the emotion, the soul you get out of the photo is much more than getting a perfectly composed photo of something that's boring and unemotional. Okay, thank you, Eric. All right, Franklin would like to know what's your thought process for deciding where and when to shoot, as in the actual location and time of day. Okay, so uh, Franklin, uh, thank you for your question. So, <laughs> I'm actually a very lazy photographer. I can never wake up early enough to shoot morning light, so that's out of the question for me. Um, and also, my schedule is so random that I never shoot when the sun's set when the light's very good. So. I'm, I'm generally shooting when the light's horrible. So that's why, once again, why I shoot with a flash. And when it comes to my personal street photography, uh, I travel a lot and I teach workshops and stuff like that. So if I'm in New York City, I'm out shooting for like eight hours a day or whatever, right? But when I'm back home, like I'm here in Berkeley, uh, I live a pretty, you know, standard, cocoa boring life. I mean, I'm not out shooting eight hours a day. So, you know, I spend a lot of time blogging, writing emails, you know, shuttling my, my partner around. I'm like her personal Uber driver. So I always just try to carry a camera with me and I just try to take photos uh, in between moments of my day. So I always have a camera on me no matter what. And so, you know, I'll take photos on the way to the grocery store. You know, I'm driving in my car and I see something interesting. I'll either shoot out my window or I'll park the car and take some photos. Uh, sometimes I'll just try to make time to shoot. So, um, you know, on a Friday, I have nothing to schedule. I'll call up some friends and say, hey, I'm out in San Francisco this weekend, you want to go and shoot? But I would, my biggest recommendation is just trying to shoot, you know, whenever, trying to, so rather than trying to always carve out huge blocks of time to shoot, try to figure out how you can squeeze in five minutes of shooting here, two minutes of shooting there. And so it ends up, I spend a lot of time with Cindy, so I end up making a lot of photos of her. So bringing my camera to a restaurant, just taking photos of her at the restaurant, or I'm on the way to the gym, photographing people, friends at the gym, and sometimes even just using your smartphone could be the best camera is that you always have it with you. And you're always out shooting uh, those moments. Awesome. Okay. Um, Alan has this question. He says, the problem I've had with street photography is not with the person I'm photographing, often with permission, but with bystanders that have watched me and then approached me either worried or sometimes even angry, asking what I am doing. Is this something you have experienced and how do you deal with it if so? Okay, so that's that's a great question. So, some okay. So let's face it, as a street photographer, sooner or later you're going to violate some sort of social norms, and you're going to have people think, "Oh, this guy's weird." And uh, a lot of people I know who are interested in street photography, it's their passion. They tell their friends and family about it. They're like, "Wow, that's really weird. Like, why would you take a photo of a stranger without their permission? It's not legal." Blah blah. And sometimes you'll have bystanders like approach. Like I've had bystanders approach me in the past, like. Um, excuse me, what are you doing? That's really rude. You're kind of a jerk. Or watch out for permission. You're like an asshole, whatever. And 
in those situations, you know, I'll just say, hey, I'm just, I'm just out making photos and of beautiful people that I see on the streets. And in those situations, it's not so matter of a matter of trying to avoid it because sooner or later it's going to happen. I think street photography is almost like driving a car. It's not a question of whether you'll ever get into a car accident or not. The question is, when are you going to get into a car accident? So I think in street photography, it's, it's important for you to be self-confident that expect people to be weirded out about what you do, but when people catch you off guard, not just stutter and be like, oh, I, I don't know, what it is. and it's happened to me in the past. Rather, I'm just very confident. I'm like, hey, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a photographer. I'm out uh, making photos of people I find interesting, and I'm sorry if I might have offended you or if it looks creepy. Trust me, I'm not a creep or I'm not doing anything weird. I'm just making photos. And sometimes I'll even give people, um, you know, my email address, my website. Uh, I recommend photographers carry on business cards because if people are sometimes upset with you photographing it or other people think you're weird, if you give them a card, it gives you a sense of legitimacy. It shows that you're not, you have nothing to hide because if you were really some sort of weird girl or a creep or a pedophile, you wouldn't hand people your, your business cards. So I think that's one practical tip I'll give. Bastian would like to know if there's one book as a street photographer everyone should own, what would it be? Okay, great question. If there's one photography book everyone could own, go straight to Amazon and search um, Magnum Contact Sheets. So this is by far my favorite. Oh, well, it's so cheap now. Okay, so there's a new edition. It's quite small. It's only 50 bucks. It's actually a very good deal. So Magnum Contact Sheets is probably the best photography book. I've ever purchased. It shows you the behind the scenes of all these great images taken in history. So like we all know this famous Henri Cartier Bresson photo of a bunch of kids playing. What we don't often see is the behind the scenes of how he made the photograph. So sending the contact sheets is very important. Um, I'd recommend people check out Eric Kim Magnum. I've written a very lengthy article on on, on Magnum contact sheets. And you could kind of see in this article, so let's say you, before you want to shout the money and invest in it, take a look at this article and you can kind of see the behind the scenes of all these amazing photos. Also, for those of you guys who want to look um, to invest more in photography books, uh, just go to my blog, you know, ericampphotography.com slash blog. And if you go to my book section, I have lots of recommendations for photography books. And I have a list of my top 10 favorite photography books here. And also, I've written photography book reviews here as well. And I have this really big list of other photography books. Um, there's also some really good photo books on the iPad or the iPhone you could download, which I recommend here. So if you just also Google Air Cam books, you could probably find this resource. Eric, I think that wraps up our time for Q&A. Thank you so much for being a part of this webinar and to everyone listening for your participation and interest. Um, I, I would like to remind everybody that we are so happy to be pre presenting these webinars on a monthly basis to help everybody stay educated about photography. Um, and just as a reminder, if you're looking for a better way to think and organize your photos, please check out the iFi technology at iFi.com. Um, and we'll see you next month where we have Lindsay Adler talking about creating wow-worthy photos. Uh, we'll have an email out to everybody to alert you how to register for that. Um, and thanks again, everyone, for participating, and Eric, for a really compelling webinar. Yeah, thank you so much for helping me organize. And if you guys want to learn more about street photography, the easiest way to find me is just Google Eric Kim, and you guys might find this photo on the left, hilarious of me. So this is what you do not want to become, a uh, camera-hungry monster. Uh, this is a photo of me and all my friends. But yeah, you can find me on Facebook, facebook.com slash Eric Photography, Twitter, Instagram, at Eric Kim Photo. And just go to my blog. EricKimPhotography.com slash blog, or just Google Eric Kim blog. And I'd recommend everyone listening if you want to learn more about um, street photography, just go to the Start Here section. I have tons of free ebooks, lectures, classes, articles, everything on street photography. And uh, thank you guys so much for listening. And if you guys are interested also in um, you know, spending more one-on-one -on -one time to conquer your fears in street photography, to check out some of my upcoming workshops. Um, some places I have some spots open in my upcoming one-day workshop in SF, Paris, Amsterdam, Prague, Vienna, Berlin, London, Istanbul, Stockholm, and New Orleans. So yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. And everyone, we have recorded this, and we'll send a note out in the next couple of weeks so that everyone know where they can access the recording. So 
Thanks, everyone. Have a beautiful evening. Okay. Thank you so much, team. Bye, Eric. Thanks. Bye.